Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for this three-part educational video series entitled What Code Officials Need to Know About HVAC System Design. My name is Louis Escobar and I'm the Manager of Codes and Standards here at ACCA, the Indoor Environment and Energy Efficiency Association. This video is part one of a series and will cover load calculations. Before we get into it, let me tell you a little bit about ACCA. As an organization, we date back to 1914 and adopted the name Air Conditioning Contractors of America in 1914. But as time in the industry have changed, so have we, and we're known now simply as ACCA. Our mission is to lead America's indoor environmental and energy professionals to business success, and we do that by representing this community with an emphasis on legislative, technical, and regulatory issues. We also provide comprehensive training and certifications for designing comfortable, safe, and energy efficient systems. And a little bit about me. I've been with ACCA since 2011 when I began as a technical services engineer, and now I lead our standard development, uh, maintenance, and revision activities. I also advocate for contractors within multiple code development processes. I serve on various technical and non-technical industry committees with groups like ICC, ASHRAE, NFPA, IATMO, and ANSI. And I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Now, there are two overarching goals for this video series. First, we want to make sure that you, the viewer, understand the basics of what it takes the designer to do an accurate residential mechanical system design. Second. We want to make sure that we prepare you to conduct an effective and efficient plan review for the purpose of issuing a permit. But I have to make it clear, this is not a design course. That is, you're not going to be able to watch these videos and then go out and do a full residential mechanical system design. That requires a lot more study and preparation. However, you will be able to understand the steps that a designer should uh, be following so that their work is not some big mystery. Now, in developing this presentation, I started with a few assumptions, and I'll share these with you so that you can gauge whether or not this series is too basic for you or if it's just right. My assumption, my first assumption is that you, the viewer, are fairly new to plans review. That is, you do, you're not a pro with years of experience uh, during which you become intimately acquainted with system design. The second assumption is that you're not an ex-designer you've never designed a system yourself. If you have and are looking for instruction on the intricacies of HVAC design, you won't find it here. But check out our website for other design course options at acca.org. And third, I assume that you're not like me and you don't go home uh, to read thrilling manufacturers manuals and specifications. Hopefully you have a life outside of work. Again, this is an introduction to give you the big picture. So, let's start. Now, this presentation was originally made in person to a room full of code officials, so they had to sit through all five parts over the course of three hours. For the video series, though, I broke it up into three parts, and each one will cover only one attribute of residential HVAC design. For this video, we'll start by discussing the designer's objectives, then delve into the main topic, which is load calculations. I'll give you an introduction on load calculations purpose and what it entails, and then I'll talk about the ACCA recommended verification points for reviewing a load calculation and share some caveats. Finally, we'll go over the ACCA design review form and other resources that we have available for you. Let's start off discussing the designer's objectives. Ideally, what they want to do is design a system that can add or remove heat at a rate that allows the inside of a home to achieve their indoor design conditions. That'll keep the occupants comfortable and safe. Now, I say ideally because some designers may not be well-versed in modern system design and could be doing it all wrong with the defense that, they're, uh, that they've been doing it for, like that forever. I'll help you watch out for those guys. So in an ideal world, an HVAC system designer would follow the full ACCA design process, which you can see here in the diagram. The boxes on the left are the general steps. Uh, you can see it's system concept, load calculation, system zoning, air distribution, 
equipment selection, duct sizing, calculation, and adjust test and balance. The boxes uh, on the in the middle are the corresponding residential ACCA manuals, and on the right column are the corresponding commercial ACCA manuals. Now for this introductory video series, we'll be focusing on one, the load calculation, which is this video, two, the equipment selection, which is the next video, and three, duct sizing, the third video. These are the core steps for proper HVAC design, and not surprisingly, the minimum code requirements. If you'd like more information on the other aspects that go into a great system design, such as zoning and balancing, check out our website for our other design courses and training. So, uh, why do we begin an HVAC system design with load calculation? Because of heat transfer, uh, that is, uh, the flow of heat. It's the root cause of all of our comfort problems. Here we see a simple illustration of a home in summertime. It shows all the places where the house gains heat from the outside. It comes in through the walls, the windows, the doors, the roof, ceilings, and depending on where they are, you can even have it in the air ducts. We also have things inside the home that produce heat, like people and appliances. Note that we don't gain heat from the ground, though. Now, in this illustration, we see how a home loses heat in the winter. Basically, it's all the same structural elements as before, but on this one, we add uh, heat loss through the floors to the ground. So, the reason that we do load calculation is because of the heat transfer we saw in the previous illustrations. In summer, heat flows into the home, and there are two types of heat. There's sensible heat, which is dry heat, the temperature that we see on the thermostat, or the dry bulb temperature. Um, there's also latent heat. However, this is, uh, this is the wet heat, and it's the one that we associate with humidity, and we also call it the wet bulb temperature. In winter, we see heat flowing out of a home, and in this case, we only care about the sensible heat. That's the dry heat again. So in summer, we see a heat gain, which requires cooling for the home, and in the winter, we see a heat loss, so we need heating for the home. It really comes down to simple physics, specifically the second law of thermodynamics. It states that over time, differences in temperature will decrease until the thermodynamic, there's a thermodynamic equilibrium. It turns out that Mother Nature doesn't like temperature differences, so when there are two regions and one is hotter than the other, we'll see heat flow from the higher temperature region to the lower temperature region until they're the same temperature. But we're not like Mother Nature. We like our temperature differences, so we've designed objects and processes to slow, stop, or reverse this physical phenomenon. Think about it. We invented coats so that when it's cold outside, we can put one on and keep ourselves warmer than it is outside. And we use the HVAC equipment to keep our buildings cool in the middle of summer. And now that we have a background down, we can start talking about the load calculation. So what is a load calculation? Well, this is the exact definition. It is the procedure for calculating the rate of sensible and latent heat flow from the outdoor environment to an indoor comfort condition space for summer cooling, and from the indoor comfort condition space to the outdoor environment for winter heating. The process also calculates the sensible and latent heat flows caused by the dwelling HVAC system. The purpose is to provide sizing values for comfort conditioning equipment. That's a mouthful, right? Well, here's a little bit uh, simpler in explanation. Load calculation is really just an account of the total heat flow into or out of our home depending on the time of the year. And the reason that we need to do one is so that the designer knows the rate of heat flow so that they can pick the right equipment that makes the occupants comfortable and safe, but also keeps energy costs down. And please note that heat flow um, is a rate and has a unit of BTUH, um, which stands for uh, British Thermal Units Per Hour. If you recall from the system design diagram, Manual J is ACCA's residential load calculation method. So what's it require? Well, Manual J, Manual J requires the designer to do a load calculation for two sets of design conditions, which we call the peak loads. For the winter, we have two design temperatures that we use in the load calculation. The outdoor design temperature will be the heating 99% dry bulb temperature. That is 99% uh, of the year, that's over 8,600 hours, 
it'll be warmer than this temperature. So that's pretty cold. Meanwhile, the indoor design temperature is going to be 70 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb. And then for the summer, we have two design temperatures used for the load calculation also. The outdoor design temperature will be the cooling 1% dry bulb temperature. That is, for only 1% of the year, so slightly more than 80 hours, will it be warmer than this temperature? So it's actually pretty hot, while uh, depending on the home's location, but it's hot for that home's location. Meanwhile, the indoor design temperature in the summer is going to be 75 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb. So where do we get these uh, design temperatures? Where do these come from? Well, the outdoor design temperature will be specific to the home's location. It's the 30-year average compiled by ASHRAE, and ACA's Manual J has these temperatures in tables 1A and 1B. Uh, we also have tables at these tables as a standalone document, which we offer for free download on our codes page. And in the fall of 2014, we also began the process of updating these tables to comply with the latest ASHRAE data. Um, the designer is required to uh, use this data for the city listed in the table um, that's closest to the location of the home. <clears throat> and the indoor design temperature, so that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit for winter heating and 75 degrees Fahrenheit for summer cooling, um, those were chosen to comply with uh, the comfort charts contained in ASHRAE Standard 55 on thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy. Here's an example of Table 1A's layout. As you can see, the leftmost column is location. Here they are all cities for the state of Alabama. If we move to the right, we see that the table gives us the elevation, latitude, heating 99% dry bulb temperature cooling 1% dry bulb temperature, the coincident wet bulb, the design grains for 55, 50, and 45% uh, relative humidity, as well as the daily temperature range for each city. For example, let's look at Birmingham Airport. The 99% dry bulb, which you see there, for heating is 23 degrees Fahrenheit. And the 1% dry bulb for cooling over on the other side is 92 degrees Fahrenheit. And at the end we see that the median daily range for Birmingham Airport is right there medium. So that means that the temperature swing throughout the normal day is not going to vary that much. So before we move on, here's a reminder of what we've covered so far. In a load calculation, the designer needs to account for every source of heat gain or heat loss. And these sources are what we call loads. Again, the example of a home's uh, heat gain in the summer. So you see all the loads. There's loads going through the ceilings, the windows, the walls, the ducts in this case. Now, let's look more uh, in depth at the various loads that are included in a normal load calculation. The first are the loads uh, that will likely have the biggest impact on the final load calculation. And those are the loads due to fenestration. These are loads that come from windows, glass doors, and skylights. And it makes sense if you think about it. If you sit next to a window in the middle of winter, you'll feel colder than anywhere else in the room because heat moves through glass so easily. So a window will lose more heat than a wall, especially when compared to a wall or a wooden door or a ceiling. But there's an important consideration for fenestration, and that's the orientation of the home. Um, that is, which way the front door faces. See, the direction that each piece of fenestration, that, that's uh, each window, each skylight, each glass door faces, plays a big role in the overall load calculation because of the sun's movement across the sky throughout the day. So a west-facing window will have a bigger load than a window that faces to the north, because we're in the northern hemisphere. Knowing which way the front door faces will help the designer get the correct heat transfer values used in a load calculation, and we'll see that a little later in the tables. Now, the next set of loads that a designer has to account for are the opaque panels, and these are these include the wood and metal doors, um, above and below grade walls, so that's above and below ground walls. Um, those are the exterior walls. There's also partition walls, which are interior walls and uh, there's ceilings and also floors.
And remember, the designer needs to account for each one of these. Infiltration is the next load that has to be accounted for. And what infiltration is, is the uncontrolled air leakage into the condition space through the cracks, the openings, and also leakage through the, uh, the attic ceiling, the crawl spaces, and, and or the basement, if it's applicable. And the most precise way to get an infil the, the infiltration load is to measure it directly using a blower door. But we know that sometimes that's not possible, like, for example, if the home's not built yet. And in that case, Manual J has some default values uh, that can be used based on some construction assumptions. Next is the ventilation load. And ventilation is simply replacing the inside air with outside air, which can be done manually, like by opening windows, or it can be done mechanically, like with the ventilation system. And you can see here the diagram shows both ventilation uh, done manually on the left and ventilation mechanically uh, on the right. So as I mentioned earlier, we also have internal loads in a home, and those are the loads produced by people that inhabit the home as well as the appliances. Uh, in this image you can see that the load can vary depending on the activity of the person, um, the, the least being when they're resting, like when they're sleeping at night, and the biggest load would be if they're inside the home exercising. And finally, we come to the system loads. Um, these are loads on the actual HVAC equipment. Um, here we see that the equipment and the ducts are in the attic and that the insulation is on the attic floor, um, which is also the ceiling of the bedroom. Um, so the equipment and the ducts are actually outside of the thermal envelope, uh, meaning that the, in the winter, they'll be really in a really, really cold attic, and in the summer, they'll be in a blisteringly hot attic. So this produces a load on the equipment. For example, the hot air in the summertime attic will produce a load on the ducts carrying the cool air even, though, uh, even through any duct insulation. So we have to account for the change in the air in the conditioned air. And logically then, if the ducts are inside of the conditioned space, so for example, if they were actually inside the bedrooms, um, then they'd be in the thermal envelope and there'd be no duct loads because they're surrounded by conditioned air. All right, now, um, we've identified the various types of load a home has. Uh, let's look at how it plays into the actual load calculation. For all of these loads, the, the designer will uh, be using one basic equation that's shown here. Um, the load for each item, uh, be it a window, a door, a wall, etc., will be the product of its U value, the area, and the temperature difference. That's the delta T. Um, the U value is the heat transfer performance index, which is a uh, measure of how well a material transfers heat. Um, you know how our value um, tells you how good a material is at slowing down the movement of heat? So a higher R value means it's better at slowing down the heat transfer. Well, the U value is the reciprocal. Uh, it tells you how good it is at moving heat across it. Um, for example, glass. It has a higher U value, and wood has a lower U value. Uh, the A in the equation is the area, and that refers to the area of the window or the wall or the ceiling in question. And finally, the delta T is the temperature difference. For example, the temperature on the outside of the window minus the temperature on the inside of the window. And it's shown here in red so that you can see how important it is to use the correct design temperatures. It affects every single load, which means that a mistake here will propagate throughout the entire load calculation. And to simplify things, Manual J often uses the term HTM in its tables. And this stands for the heat transfer multiplier, and it's simply equal to the uh, U value times the temperature difference. It actually doesn't change the equation, it's just an algebraic uh, simplification. So, if you're at all familiar with um, ACCA's Manual J, then you know that a significant portion of the book um, is just basically tables that contain the values used in the equation um, for each type of construction found in a house. And if it doesn't, then it uh, references where to find the values. Like, for example, for Windows, you can see if uh, the uh, NFRC rating um, is, is present. Uh, next, we'll see an example of these tables. Um, we're going to start off with Table 4A, which contains the heating and uh, cooling performance values for opaque panels. 
Um, remember, those are the walls and the floors, and etc. Um, the table will have construction numbers, U values, and something that we call the CLTD, which stands for cooling load temperature difference. So here you can see that um, part of the table, you can see actually just part of the table that corresponds uh, to an insulated uh, ceiling under an attic. <clears throat> On the left hand column, you can see that the various construction numbers um, go from 16A slash 0 to 16A21. So if you look at the two columns over, um, you can see that the second number corresponds to the level of insulation. So for ceiling 16A15, the insulation R value is R15. And the table also gives you the corresponding U values in the next column over. Now on the right side, the table provides CLTD values depending on the design temperature difference. Uh, that's the 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, or 35 row and also depending on the daily range. So that's low, medium, or high. That's where you see the L, M, and H. Uh, remember that the C CLTD is the, um, in this table, is the cooling load temperature difference for the ceiling under the attic uh, or the attic knee wall. And the top of the table actually gives you additional information to help you make sure that it's the correct construction for what's in the house. Here it talks about ventilation off, uh, options and roofing materials, etc. And roof colors. Okay, now let's look at an example for a uh, table on fenestration. Uh, here we have table 2A for default performance values for generic fenestration. Um, this one is for generic windows and glass doors. Uh, we can see that we'll get different U and uh, SHGC values for constructions that um, that have metal with no break, metal with the break, wood or wood with metal clad, and also for insulated fiberglass. And here the SHGC stands for the solar heat gain coefficient. Um, it's used in the equations throughout the manual. Um, we see on the first row uh, that goes all the way across that number two is for double pane low E glass design for cold climate and that it has an emissivity of low E coating of uh, 0 0.60. Um, now option 2A, 2B, and 2C are more specific as to what type of window or glass door. For example, 2A is for operable windows or sliding glass doors. Um, and reading across, we can uh, get the U values and the SHGC for the corresponding framing. Next, we have table 3A slash 3, or hyphen 3, uh, for reflective glass in generic windows and doors. Um, here we see six sub tables. Hopefully, you can see them. Um, uh, the three tables in the top row correspond to a situation where there is no internal shading, while the bottom three tables are for vertical and horizontal blinds with slats at 45 degrees. <clears throat> Each table corresponds to either the single pane, double pane, or triple pane glass, and will give the users the corresponding U value, SC value, which stands for shading coefficient, and the SHGC at the top of each smaller table. The designer will use will use that um, the design cooling temperature difference um, or CTD uh, in combination with the glass's exposure to get the HTM against again that's the heat transfer multiplier uh, for the rough opening. As you can see, the HTM will be different depending on the direction the glass faces, with uh, the highest HTMs being for glass that faces east or west uh, or southeast or southwest. Um, remember from earlier in the presentation, the direction of the ha that the house faces in the load calculation needs to uh, match the actual conditions for the house because it plays such a big role throughout, uh, as we can see here, for fenestration. Now, as mentioned previously, ideally the designer would measure the infiltration, but if that's not possible, then Manual J provides defaults, as you can see here. The designer would need to best approximate uh, the construction tightness. Uh, using that in the floor area of the heated space, 
um, the table will provide default uh, air change values for the house. On the far right, you can see that the table also gives infiltration uh, CFM values for one fireplace. The next example um, of the uh, table that we have here is one for the default values for internal loads. Um, the top row gives you a basic default load of 1200 sensible BTUH, um, that's British thermal units per hour, um, and that corresponds to a refrigerator um, and a range with a vented hood. But below you can see that there are also um, other scenario options to better approximate what an existing house actually has, and it's up to the designer to, to pick the best scenario for the home. And finally, we have uh, a kind of a meta uh, table um, for duct loads. This table can be used to find the actual table that contains the necessary values for the duct system loads, depending on the location and geometry of the duct system. Um, on the left column, the first option is for a duct system located in an unvented attic above a 16A ceiling that gets up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit uh, when it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And moving to the right, we see that there are two options for the system geometry, um, either radial ducts with outlets at the center of the room or trunk and branch ducts with outlets in the center. Um, picking the correct one for the application will send the designer to either table 7AR or 7AT. So if there's one thing to take away from the example tables we just saw, it's that they can be kind of tricky to navigate, especially when you have to navigate so many for one load calculation. Fortunately, though, the designer has four main options. The first is to do a simple load calculation that conforms um, to the requirements of the abridged edition of Manual J. But in order to do this, the home has to uh, be 100% compatible with the, uh, the AE checklist at the start of the book. Um, this can really only be done for very simple homes, but if it's applicable, then the designer can choose to do it by hand or using the ACA Manual J8 speed sheet. Um, and this speed sheet is a free Excel file developed by ACA that can be used to do a simple block load calculation. But if the house doesn't comply 100% with the AE checklist, then the designer will have to do a load calculation that complies with the full version of Manual J. Um, this one too can be done by hand, but it'll have to be it'll be extremely hard and time consuming. I mean, come on, you just saw those tables that we just went through. Um, that's why when doing full load calculation, designers usually uh, use third party software to make the job easier. But that comes with its own set of issues, which I'll discuss a little bit later. <clears throat> now, before moving on uh, to the next slide, though, I just want to point out that ACA does vet third-party software for compliance with the Manual J8 procedures. Um, you can find a listing of the approved software on ACA.org under the Standards tab and then selecting the Approved Software tab. So um, now we've seen the various types of loads and that comprise a load calculation um, and even seen some examples of the tables that the designers will be using. Um, you should have a pretty good handle on what a load calculation is. But just to be sure, let's repeat it all together. A load calculation is an account of the total heat flow into or out of a home depending on the time of the year. And basically, the designer will be accounting for every wall, window, door, infiltration, person, etc. for the home at two times of the year, one for heating and one for cooling. But you, the plan reviewer, have limited time and resources. Surely you can't check every single detail of every submitted load calculation, and we understand that. So instead, we need to identify specific, discrete design parameters that you can check easily and that will help you gauge the uh, accuracy of any given load calculation. Uh, I'll be going over those in the next slide, but first let me explain that by accuracy, I mean that the designer followed the correct procedure. Because we're not going to be checking every aspect of the calculation, there's a possibility that a small mistake was made somewhere. Maybe the wrong uh, SHGC value for a window, who knows. But by checking some aspects, we can be sure that the overall calculation will not be severely affected. And finally, I'll give you some caveats to help you out even more. 
<clears throat> so here's a list of nine aspects of a load calculation that we at ACCA recommend to be checked on every submitted load calculation. They were chosen because they're easy to verify, but if all nine points are correct, the designer obviously followed Manual J's requirements. The first is the location of the home. If you're located in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the top line of the load calculation shouldn't read Los Angeles, California. That designer wasn't paying attention, and the load calculation will be completely wrong. And if something that simple is wrong, you can bet that other things will be wrong. The next one is the outdoor design conditions used in the load calculation. For most jurisdictions, this will be pretty uniform for all of the load calculations that you'll see from any contractor because there's usually only one location for Manual J, Table 1A or 1B that corresponds to your jurisdiction. Now, those location, those jurisdictions that have uh, have more than one area, for example, Fairfax County, which has three, um, will have the discretion to choose which set of outdoor conditions best matches the house in question. Um, the indoor design conditions are next and should be uniform. That is 75 degrees uh, Fahrenheit dry bulb um, for cooling and 70 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb for heating unless there's a code requirement that supersedes this. Next is the all-important orientation of the home. Remember, the direction of any glass faces will play a big role in the overall load calculation so that the orientation in the home, uh, of the home in the load calculation has to really match the actual home's orientation. Um, next is the, the number of occupants in a home, and that's pretty simple to check since it's simply the number of bedrooms plus one. Manual J assigns one person per bedroom except the master bedroom, which has two. That's just the default. Um, condition floor area is also pretty simple to check uh, since it should equal what the home's condition floor area is or what the plan says um, for a home that's not yet built. Uh, the next uh, two checks pertain to fenestration the eave overhang depth and internal shading for windows and the number of skylights should not be different than what the home has or what the building plans show. If the internal shading is, uh, isn't is known then Manual J actually has defaults um, that should be used and that will be in one of the tables. And the final check is a simple arithmetic ch uh, check uh, to be sure that the sensible latent heat gain in the summer is equal to the total heat gain. You'd be surprised how many times those those don't add up. Now, while our recommended minimum verification points are easy to check, we also have some warnings for the overall review for you. First, know that some designers actively try to fudge the numbers to get bigger loads than the house really has, and they do it in a number of different ways. <clears throat> Um, they may change the outdoor design temperatures because they opine that the, uh, the numbers listed in tables 1A and 1B are incorrect for their location. Uh, they may want higher numbers during the summer so that they can oversize the unit to avoid callbacks. Uh, this should not be permitted. The numbers in table 1A and 1B are industry accepted numbers that ASHRAE has compiled over decades and is a better reflection of the actual condition than the designer's whims. Um, they may change the outdoor design, oh no, no, sorry, they may also uh, be changing the numbers um, by applying a, a factor of safety to the final load calculation, the final total load. That is, they'll just add an extra 5 or 10 or 15 percent just to be sure, you know, just in case they messed up. And this is also not permissible. Manual J is an engineering tool that already has an inherent and appropriate factor of safety built into it. Other designers may try to use the worst case scenario. For example, uh, for infiltration, they may try to use defaults for loose construction, um, but for a new home built to code, that would be completely wrong. Others may want to add more occupants for various reasons. One popular one that we hear is that the homeowner hosts a lot of parties, but Manual J makes it clear that the designer should, shouldn't add internal loads for special events or added uh, extra occupancy loads for entertaining. And finally, you may run into a designer that uh, into a designer that includes loads, even though the ducts are in conditioned space. Um, remember that duct loads are only present if they're in unconditioned space. And overall, Manual J instructs the user to be thorough and reflect the actual condition of the home. 
Um, so any deviation from this shouldn't be permitted. And finally, remember I mentioned that the uh, using third-party software has its own issues? Well, um, make sure that you're, you're just as thorough reviewing a program's printout as you are a hand-done loan, load calc, um, because using software doesn't guarantee accuracy. In fact, it may make it harder because the user has to know not only the procedures in Manual J, but also has to understand how the software works. Um, and they need to especially pay attention to the program's defaults because they don't always match their conditions. And that, that could take a while to learn for them. All right. Um, now we've talked about the load, what a load calculation is uh, and looked at the loads um, that should be addressed. And I've shared with you the ACA recommended minimum verification points as well as some extra caveats when reviewing a load calculation. Now let's talk about the resources we have available for you. The major one is the ACA design review form. On this one simple form, you have all the information that, uh, that's needed to be checked for a load calculation, the equipment selection, and duct sizing procedures for residential mechanical system design. Um, we make it available for free download on our codes page, uh, which you can see at the bottom of this slide. Just go to acca.org slash standards slash codes to download your copy. Um, many jurisdictions have incorporated it in their plans review process because it standardizes the review procedures and cuts down on the amount of paperwork submitted for each permit request. <clears throat> it's also customizable so your jurisdiction can add your logo on the top right side. Now let's take a little closer look at um, the review forms section. Okay, at the, at the top you see that the identification information um, helps you keep track of the contractor, the specific plan being reviewed, and the home's address. It also shows up um, up front what it is, uh, what other required information or documentation is attached to this form. But it's the next section that's uh, pertinent to the portion of this video covers, uh, and that's the load calculation portion. Um, as you can see here, as a place where the contractor can record each one of our nine recommended minimum verification points. At a quick glance, you'll be able to see the outdoor design conditions, which again should be pretty uniform for all the load calculations that a typical jurisdiction will see. You also um, can easily compare the stated orientation, number of bedrooms, and condition floor area uh, with the home's plan. And under the summer design conditions, you'll be able to quickly add up the sensible and latent heat gain to verify uh, the stated total heat gain is correct and um, that arbitrary uh, safety factors weren't applied. <clears throat> now, I want to stress that this form is available to you for free. All you have to do is visit ACA's code page. Again, the link is right there. Now, another resource that we have available um, that we've developed specifically for code officials is a booklet entitled Bob's House. Essentially, what it is is a case study that walks you through all the steps of the residential HVAC system design. Um, so you'll see an example of a model home from the beginning to the end. And this booklet is available for purchase at ACA's online store, which you see here is ACA.org slash store. And for those wishing to go a little deeper and get a better understanding of the design, of the design process, ACA also offers uh, various design courses. Um, the introductory one is the Designing for Quality Installation, uh, which can be taken as a three-day in-person in course here in Arlington, Virginia, or as an online certificate program that takes around 22 to 25 hours to complete. Um, this one's comprised of 28 videos on demand and can be taken at your own pace. <clears throat> now, those that already have a solid understanding of mechanical system design can take out, uh, take our uh, educational program in instructor certification, um, that is EPIC class, to become an instructor of HVAC system design. And this course is uh, an intensive four-day course that's also available here in our offices in Arlington, Virginia. And uh, we always encourage anyone that can make it to attend the technical sessions at our annual conference each year. Um, for, for more details on that, check out um, acca.org. All right, 
Thank you uh, everyone for joining me on this video covering the first aspect of residential HVAC system design, uh, that's the uh, load calculation. The next video in the series is part two on equipment selection. Bye.